Good afternoon. How are you doing on a uh, Tuesday afternoon? Huh? You doing good? Ready to go? Hmm? <laughs> All right. Oops, that's not the first slide. Yeah, that's the first slide. Okay, I always thought these Ignite things were kind of exciting. So that's why I decided to do one and see how it really is. Especially on a uh, day before the end of the conference when everybody's kind of, you know, a little bit saturated with good things, information, a lot of data. Uh, my name is Eris Papadopoulos. And uh, I just retired last fall after being around 25 years in construction, building things. And I want to understand the audience here. How many of you are in government? Can you just raise your hands? Government, government? Just one. Oh, OK. No. Two. Uh, private sector? Private sector? Just a few. Academia? OK, a few. Anybody in construction? Nobody in construction. OK. So I guess I can say whatever I want here. <laughs> just, a, just a joke. Anyway, so I've been involved with uh, UNISDR for five years. Uh, uh, four and a half, let's say, and served as a chair of the private sector advisory group that was put together by Margareta uh, about four and a half years ago for two years, between 11 and 13, and decided after I retired that resilience and disaster risk reduction was going to be my uh, passion, let's say. Not profession, passion. You got to have passion to do something after you uh, retire from a career. And I just wrote a book that basically documents what I learned in 25 years, what we're doing wrong in construction, what we should be doing better, and how we can share some of this uh, with, with others who are, are not that knowledgeable what goes on uh, behind the scenes, or what I call in the black box here. And I use the US as a case study uh, for several reasons. I'll go through that. Uh, but primarily because that's where I have most of my experience, and I know where the skeletons are. So let's begin. Uh, an ancient Greek philosopher once said, to understand health, study disease. And a modern uh, philosopher is saying, to understand resilience, study non-resilience. You know, let's see what's going wrong. The first step in either health or resilience is to accept responsibility. Hazards do not cause disasters. Non-resilience causes disasters. We create non-resilience, therefore we cause disasters. Accept responsibility. Why the built environment? Well, I think most of you know that we spend most of our lives in buildings. Our homes, our offices, schools, whatever you're doing. We only spend about 5% of our time away from buildings. So buildings are where we live. It is the front line of defense against hazards. The first function of a building is to protect us against hazards. hazards. And when those buildings go down, we are exposed, and every, our possessions, everything is exposed to the hazard. So that's a, a very important characteristic of buildings. Most of the world's investment is in the built environment. And when I say built environment, I mean everything, from bridges, public buildings, to our homes, schools, hospitals, small business uh, offices, and so forth. And the projections that are being made is that, especially in the developing world, we, as a humanity, are going to invest more in the next 30, 40 years in the built environment than what we have invested in the whole history of humankind. Why the U.S.? Actually, the U.S. is 20% today of the world's built environment, even though it has 5% of the population. It's made a tremendous investment over the last half century in the built environment. However, that built environment is failing. It is the number one country in the world in terms of losses, economic losses, from disasters. And the trend line is deteriorating. Just a quick synopsis here of, of what's going on. The US basically lost in the decade of 2000, 2009, more than all the other nine ranking countries total, an average of $35 billion a year. That number's gone worst. In this decade, it's rating of about $50 billion a year. So the trend line is really deteriorating. And you could say, well, the US has the money to spend. You know, it's only 10% of deficit. Why should I be interested if I'm in China or, or uh, Southeast Asia or Africa? Why should I be interested in this? The reason you should be interested in this is because 
you will be investing too a lot of billions of dollars in the built environment. You do not want to be on this road, on this path, 30, 40, 50 years from now. So what can we learn from the U.S. to not repeat the path that has been followed? Okay, first of all, the U.S. is a very hazard-prone country. There are, whole, there are hazards seismic on the west, uh, uh, tornadoes. Uh, the, the U.S. is the number one country in tornadoes in the world, believe it or not. Uh, hurricanes on the south and, uh, and east coast, uh, flooding almost everywhere from rivers to uh, ocean flooding. So it's a very high hazard country. You would expect its codes to be very strong, therefore, but they are not. We get one chance, I think, to build the built environment. If we have to build it twice, it's an enormous drain, not just on economic resources, but also on the environment. We've got to do it once and do it right. Build back better. I think we've heard this at the conference here. Sounds good, right? You like build back better? But is it enough? Is build back better enough? Or is it like, okay, I'll wait till I have a heart attack and then I'll start living better? How about building better from the start? We're spending much more money investing in new facilities than we are in post-disaster. Why shouldn't that be built better from the start? The difference is going from disaster reaction to resilient, resilient proaction. Oddly, there's an 80-20 imbalance when we look at the built environment. Actually, 80% of the built environment is residential and small commercial, including everybody's homes, and that gets a very small percent of our attention. In fact, most of this conference is talking about infrastructure, public facilities, which is just 20% of the built environment and gets 80% of the attention. The resilience bar is set, let's say, relatively high, for infrastructure and large commercial, but it's way down here for residential and uh, uh, small commercial. We are missing the biggest part of the built environment, therefore. The result is that many people will lose their lifetime home savings because the bar is set so low. And most of the disasters are happening like this. Many roads lead to non-resilience. There's one road and only one road to, that leads to resilience in the built environment. And the drivers are along three uh, dimensions. Regulatory, governance, and market. And we'll look at each, each one, one of these separately and then discuss how the U.S. has fared on each one of these and why we're doing so badly. Ah, I don't know why this came out like this. Look, looked okay on the... Uh, okay. Well... There are three questions here to ask. First of all, do we have national standards in a country? Yes or no? In some countries we do, but in other countries we rely on local officials and local bodies to develop their own adjustments, let's say, to standards, compromises to standards. What does compromise mean? It means going from here further down. Where is the resilience bar set? Is it set high, or is it set medium, or is it set low? And is there enforcement, not just of codes, but of practices? Because it's not just enough to have a code, you've got to actually build it well. You've got to practice good construction practices. So that's part of enforcement. When you look at the US, yeah, we do not have national standards. We have model codes, and then the states take, they modify them. Then the cities and county states, they compromise, a lot of interests get involved, and especially in residential, we end up down here in terms of where the resilience bar is. We do have, however, good enforcement. You know, those low standards are relatively well enforced, good practices, but they're still low. So we don't make the resilience cut on regulatory drivers. What about governance? Is there national leadership? And I mean national leadership not, not just when disasters happen, but to drive resilience, to bring the parties together. Do we use a, a structure that's based on the emergency system that we have? Or is the resilience long-term strategy developed by an independent group? 
Are there conflicting policies? In the US, basically, it's all negative. The national leadership is absent. FEMA is really a firefighting organization and not a long-term strategy organization on, on resilience, although they're, they're trying, but they don't have the time. They're fighting too many fires, and we do have conflicting policies. The third is market drivers. Transparency, is there transparency in the system that the public can know what is being destroyed, why is it is being destroyed? Is there accountability when things go wrong, not just of officials, but also of builders? And finally, are there incentives to encourage above code, stronger construction? In the US, again, all those are no, no, no. So the US scored eight, no, eight no's out of nine. Therefore, we have the results, you know, $50 billion a year. Why is the resilience bar set so low in residential and small commercial? First of all, it's the area which has the least land planning and building code development and enforcement. As I said, we focus 80% of our attention on the larger facilities. Second, there's a big misconception that resilience can be sacrificed for affordability. And we'll talk a little bit more. You know, what, what does it mean to have affordable buildings? And what does it not mean? Third, public policies often encourage risk taking and prolong low levels of awareness. I mean, one example of that is the uh, national flood insurance program we have in the US that essentially has encouraged people to take more flood risk by underpricing it and going into flood uh, prone areas. And finally, there are private interests that profit from the status quo and oppose raising the bar. It is profitable for some groups to be non-resilient. What does it mean to be affordable? Is it the lowest first cost? Is it the lowest life cycle cost? Is it the lowest life cycle cost and risk of loss or the lowest life cycle cost and risk of loss to both the individual and society? You can make something affordable by lowering the standards. You can make something affordable by sharing the risk with society. You can make something affordable by passing on the risk to future generations, like our children. It's false affordability. So are we really uh, compromising uh, uh, resilience for affordability? Resilience means raising the bar. I know I've opened probably more questions than I've answered, but that was part of my purpose. Because if you want to read more about this subject, please do look into the website, buildingresilient.com, to understand what really is happening in the built environment, something that for many is a black box, uh, and the effort here is to try to de demystify it. And um, part of what I've done is also created a nonprofit group called uh, Resilience Action Fund, which aims to educate, make, create more transparency and awareness in the built environment, as, as people do not really understand what goes on there. And I think I have a few minutes for questions, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. Your name? Uh, my name is Sever Joseph. I come from Haiti. Um, for me, one chance is a big advocacy for the world. What do you think about the multiple mechanism? for better reinforcing resili the resilience in the world. Uh, so I can understand your question. Your question is what would be a good mechanism, mechanism. for reinforcing resilience in the, world? in the world? OK. I think transparency is the first. For me, the important thing is for citizens to know what the truth is. Many countries are reluctant to admit that building codes, especially in residential, do not protect them. I mean, you can find documents, you know, in FEMA that say that, you know, but will they come out publicly and announce that? No. The auto industry went through such a phase 50 years ago. Automobiles were unsafe, a spotlight was put on it, and manufacturers were forced to become more resilient. And today we have safer automobiles because of that. So public awareness and transparency. 
Thank you. I think our time is up. Appreciate your audience. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference. And uh, we'll pass around a few cards if you uh, want to uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much.